Landline, some of us still have them. We have not had one since we moved here, but I guarantee you today, when I get home from church, the first thing that'll come to my mind is I better get to the office and check the answering machine. I don't even have one. It just became such a habit because we had always had a message that was waiting. We had in this age of cell phones, we take our phone with us. We do not need to stay close to home. Well, some may say that that gives us freedom. I'm not so sure. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can get a hold of at any time. People can call you wherever you are as long as you've got cell service. You get a phone call. And I would guess today I would say that at times I would just assume that we'd go back to the landline where I didn't have to carry the cell phone with me. And but at the same time, I realized that most people would be lost without Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, and you keep naming them. I'm sure that the younger set would certainly be lost without that. The old phone line, though, was something special. I remember in northern Idaho when we moved there, we did not have a phone of any kind for a year in our house. Now, I don't know today if we could live like that. There was no phone. There was one phone on the whole hill where we lived, and that was our neighbors. If anyone was supposed to get hold of my dad, they called them. They came to our door, said, hey, so-and-so is trying to get hold of you. We'll leave our house, and you can take the, the phone call. Now, I don't know that ever happened in 2024. We dwell so far away from that. Those phone calls, sometimes they brought good news. Sometimes they were devastating phone calls. As we journey toward the resurrection, I want to bring to your attention the most important call of all. We covered the first Sunday of the month why we even need the resurrection. That is because we have a sin problem, don't we? We need a sacrifice that we covered last week. We need an effectual sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ. He's the one that brings reconciliation between humanity and God. God is actively calling all people to the benefits of the atonement. Obviously, God does not need Android or iPhone to do that. There's no arguments in the courts of heaven which is better. God uses his holy word, doesn't he? Through the Holy Spirit as well, we hear the call of God. And that call reaches everyone, whether in the middle of America or in the Amazon, in the deep jungles of South America. Although it's not an audible call, it is the most important call you and I will ever receive. The call to salvation. Let's look at the word of God this morning. If you can, please stand and honor the word. 2 Peter 3, 8. <clears throat> but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are less to be dissolved, what sort of people are you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. May God have his blessing to his word this morning. Through repentance from sin and transformation by grace, God calls everyone to his eternal kingdom. This passage, we have to say that the timetable of God is correct. 
How many remember the old railroad stations that you went into, there was a timetable posted? Now we don't have that today. We do have in airports, we got arrivals and departures on planes. And there's always, when I go to an airport and looking to get on a plane and I find my number, it's always nice to see those two words on time. <clears throat> Not delayed two hours or three hours. But God's timetable is always correct, is it not? We cannot know exactly what the apostle meant by that phrase, a thousand years is one day, one day is a thousand years. It is taken out of Psalm 90 verse 4. Now if we take that literally, the church age has lasted about two days since the crucifixion, since the church was brought into being. It's only been two days in God's timetable. Today we seem to be obsessed with studying the end times, unlocking the secrets of the prophecies and revelation, Daniel, Ezekiel. While it is, help, it is helpful to decipher the word of God, we cannot know more than what the scriptures reveal to us. You know, I read in the Gospels that Jesus said while he was here on earth, he says, only the Father knows, not the Son, nor the angels in heaven. And that seems fairly clear to me that we cannot know more than what the scriptures tell us. <clears throat> Excuse me. I remember back in, oh, you know, the 70s, I guess, and that book came out, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. And I read that thing and just devoured it. I thought, wow, this guy has got it down. I'm not speaking anything. Don't take me wrong against Hal. He's still around. I understand that. But I think he had 1985 nailed down. And like we know it came and went. We've had many dates nailed down by experts that said that I know for a fact that we can know at least the year when Christ will return. Well, this passage sort of tells us otherwise, doesn't it? Even though we observe the fulfillment of signs, we do see signs around us that are pointing towards something, and we'd be foolish to ignore those. Even though we see those signs, we never know the exact day, year, or time when Christ will return. God never intended for us to understand that, no matter who says otherwise. The wisest minds of eschatology do not even agree. So friends, let's be careful that we don't get so obsessed with that that we miss the more important thing. Although God dwells in eternity, he also controls time. When we continually try to decipher the times and the seasons, we're getting very close to delving into an area that we don't belong. How dare we judge whether God is early, late, or on time? He knows when he's on time. And let's leave it in his capable hands. Even when it appears that God has delayed his appearance, the scripture says that he is delayed for a very specific reason, so that everyone can come to repentance. And God is using new ways and new ideas, new technology to make sure that happens. I just read this week that the Jesus film has been out for years. It's already been very effective. But they now have a way that they're taking the, they have a, a box, a, it looks like a phone I guess, that has its own built-in hotspot. And they can go into an area that they should not even be. And this sends out a signal to everyone that has a cell phone telling them they have an important message. They respond to this message and hear the gospel. So, I mean, things are happening to get people exposed to the gospel word. The faithfulness and the love of God defy all our human understanding. Even when people resist the call of God, God gives them another chance to receive it. When it seems that this world is spinning out of control, remember this, that God remains large and in charge. He has not, he has not been defeated. He's not confused. 
He is not wondering what to do next. God is in charge today. His timetable is correct. But the call of God is to one thing, is it not? Peter says that God calls us to repentance. The Lord is patient toward you. Aren't you glad for the patience of God? Have you ever tried someone's patience? I bet you probably did this week. Tried someone's patience just a little bit. God says he is patient with you. Not wanting you or anyone to perish, but come to eternal life. In the original language, that word repentance means turning from and turning to. Turning from and turning to. The subject of repentance has kind of fallen on hard times in our world. We hear a lot about the love of God, the mercy of God. We hear about the grace of God. But friends, repentance has to be first. Jesus Christ preached repentance. John the Baptist, obviously before Jesus, preached repentance. The apostles preached repentance. And when we bypass repentance, we short-circuit the whole thing. We must come to a place of repentance before we can come to a knowledge of salvation in Jesus Christ. You know, it may be exciting to try to pinpoint the exact return of Christ, but the more important point is turning to the one who has created us. Peter says that the day of the Lord will come as a thief. What does that mean? Well, friends, if you knew a thief was coming, wouldn't you be prepared? We don't know when the thief strikes. We will not know when Christ is going to return. Thus, we must live prepared, always ready. God offers us provenient grace. That is the grace that goes before conversion and prepares us to receive his saving grace. However, I want to make it very clear this morning that just because God calls everyone to repentance, not everyone will respond. We, I do not believe that the scriptures teach that everyone's going to be saved. It's not a universal salvation. It's a universal call, not a universal salvation. The power of our free will enables us to disregard the call and to deny the transforming grace of the truth found in God's word. Salvation through faith in Christ requires us to embrace the gospel message. But God does not compel anyone nor force the unwilling those that refuse to believe will refuse to believe. God has given every person that inner moral agency that can either choose to accept the gift of God's grace or choose to reject it. Not everyone's going to make it, friends. I hate to say that. I've said before, some of the worst theology in the world's found in funerals. Friends, I don't know how to say this kindly, but there are some funerals that I'm going to have to be very careful because I don't know what to say. I know we preach to the living. But friends, we have to make the decision to receive the grace of God. Just because you heard the call of God does not mean you're born again. That call is universal. But you must make that decision to open your heart to receive the gift of grace. Someone has said this, if some are excluded, it's because they exclude themselves by rejecting the gospel offer. As for God, he wants everyone to be saved. But he gives you and he gives me the choice to say yes or no. I know that 
that hits us hard because there's friends that we have, there's relatives that we have that to this point have rejected the call. God's not giving up on them. Let's not give up on them. Keep praying for them. Keep believing. Our responsibility is to present the gospel to all people in all places and all circumstances. I have good friends that disagree with this next statement, but I'm going to state it because this is what I believe and what we as a church believe. God has not elected some to be saved and some to be lost. He desires that no one should perish, but come to a knowledge of the truth through repentance. I'm glad that I understand that this morning. That gives me great comfort that God wants everyone to be born again, to be saved. Peter also, there's a lot in here, friends, but third point for us this morning. Peter says, we're waiting for a better place. We are looking for a new heaven and a new earth. Now, friends, as you travel this world, as you travel our state, Traveling in the United States, or many places, there's a lot of good things to see. It looks pretty good. A lot of beautiful spots. But there comes a point in time when there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. The home of righteousness, the home of righteousness, because the righteous one will live and rule there. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will dwell there forever. Can you imagine an eternal residence where where sin and righteousness are absent? My mind goes in strange directions. How will you ever have news if there's nothing bad to report? (laughs) I mean, that's about all we get today is bad news. But in that eternal home of righteousness, whether there'll be any news, I don't know. But can you imagine no sin, no unrighteousness, no murders, no stealing, no lying, no uncleanness of any kind, but the home of eternal righteousness. Those whose names are in God's Lamb's book of life will be there forever. The transformation of everything will be the order of new things in both the heaven and the earth. You know, even nature itself has been affected by the fall, but that's all going to be turned around someday. The purpose of God is recreation, not destruction. Renewal, not annihilation. God wants to restore in that new place, that new heaven and new earth. Well, friends, the exclusive, the exclusive call of God, of God to salvation through Christ is under increasing attack. To say that Jesus is the only way to God is viewed as narrow, viewed as old-fashioned. We are told that we should have a pluralistic viewpoint of salvation. The Hindus come to God their way. The Muslims come to God through Allah. Don't you understand that there's more than one way to God? According to this book, there is only one way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Plain and simple. No matter who says otherwise. The testimony of the apostles agreed with that same statement. Remember when they were under persecution, they were being told, don't you preach in Jesus' name? And Peter, who wrote this book right here, he said, you judge for yourselves who we should obey. For we cannot hear, help but speak about the things that we have seen and heard. For salvation is found in no other name other than Jesus Christ. That is the way to God. Jesus Christ is not just a way to God. He is the way to the Father. May God help us to be attentive and sensitive when God calls us to salvation, when God calls us to a deeper commitment, 
and a walk with God that lasts throughout all our lives. We never remain the same after hearing the call of God. If you never heard the call of God before today, and you hear it today, you will not remain the same ever. You either receive the call, find transformation through faith in Christ, or you reject the call and pay the price in eternity. Friends, it is that serious. You either receive the call of God to salvation or you reject it. Only two choices. Since this earth is temporary, we should focus on eternal values. Peter says everything here that we see, the things that mean so much to us today, someday they're all going to be consumed by fire. So knowing these things are, how should we live today? We should live holy lives. We should live in transformation. When we consider the patience and the mercy of God towards us, we should bow in humble repentance, humble repentance and turn from our evil ways. Living in holy love for God should be our lifestyle. The cross of Christ and the empty tomb point us toward eternal life when this earthly pilgrimage is ended. I pray God that help, will help us, help me, and all of us to be stepping stones towards God, towards righteousness. I do not want to be a stumbling block to anyone. May God help us to be stepping stones. Although the judgment of God is delayed because of his mercy, his judgment is certain. God is calling us today to repentance, to salvation through faith in the shed blood of Christ. Let us not ignore that call, for our eternal destiny rests on our response. Even now, let us turn to Jesus. Let us repent. Let us find forgiveness and the gift of his eternal life. Have you received that today? I trust everyone in this room has. If you have not, as I pray, just pray to the Lord, pray to Jesus Christ, ask him for forgiveness, ask him for his salvation. He's more than willing to give it. Please receive it. Let us pray. Lord God, today we bow.